Hello and welcome to episode 8 of What's Tom Reading? I'm Tom and today I'm talking about the autobiographical expose called Red Roulette by Desmond Shum. This book was a wild ride through the excesses and evils of the Chinese Communist Party and is definitely worth your time. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. All right, guys. So today we are talking about an awesome little book written by a Chinese expatriate. It's sort of like a a big expose of the many evils and excesses of the Chinese Communist Party, the ruling class in China. Uh, The full title of this book is Red Roulette, an insider story of wealth, power, corruption and vengeance in today's China. And right off the bat, um, I wanted to draw attention to maybe the slightly different sound to this podcast. Two things on that. The first thing is that I got a new microphone to replace the one that was chewed and destroyed by my toddler. Uh, This is a shiny, nice condenser microphone that I'm fairly close to as I'm speaking. And so it kind of changes the dynamic of the sound a little bit. Um, It gives it more of that soft podcasty feel that so many shows seem to to dig. Um, The second main thing is that I'm doing this kind of on the quieter side because it's late at night right now and I'm in the the back room trying to avoid disturbing the kids. Um, I wanted to get to this though and talk about it because this is a really, really cool uh, book that I finished reading. I picked it up originally. Um, It it was recommended in a podcast that I was listening to and I thought, you know what, I'm going to check that out. So I picked it up originally kind of having... Um, a certain set of expectations that, uh, that it would talk about, you know, standard corruption stuff that you hear about in China, you know, um, trading favors and everything like that. Um, and in that dimension, this book definitely did not disappoint. It was, it was big on, uh, (laughs) on the corruption, uh, exposure, but One thing that I didn't expect was that it was also um, kind of an interesting um, biographical sketch of this guy, Desmond Shum, um, and his life story. It's sort of like a, I I guess this book was ghost written, um, but it's like an autobiographical uh, sketch kind of of his early years and how he kind of rose to prominence in China. And he has a, he has a very interesting story and I'll talk about some of that um, as we go. Um, One thing to be aware of right off the bat, and maybe I should save this for this stuff. I didn't like so much um, section on the back end, but um, the first, like (laughs) I'd say like 75% of this book is just this guy's like, autobiography like it's just him talking about like how he was on the swim team in high school it's not um i was like come on get to the get to the you know deep state corruption or whatever um and it was it it wasn't until towards the end of the book where you really start to dig into that and so um it, it was a bit of a slow start for me but it did eventually pay off big time on that front so let's head on over to the wikipedia page of uh, mr shum here so that we can learn a little bit more about him and see what uh, the chinese government has allowed to remain on the internet so it says desmond shum is the author of red roulette um He's the husband of a arrested Chinese billionaire, and I apologize that I'm not going to get m- many of these names right, but it's uh, Duan Weihong, but uh, he called her Whitney. That's That was her uh, Western name that she chose for herself. Um, and the book kind of details like their relationship with kind of high-ranking Chinese officials and how they kind of cultivated this sort of... Um, uh, it's like a culture of like favors and uh, they, they call it Guangxi. And again, I, I apologize for any pronunciations here, uh, but it's this this kind of culture of trading favors and um, like just like the, how they deal with like their social networks of power. It's like it's it's like a it's like part of it, it underpins their culture in China. And it's sort of like a, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Um, sort of like 
just kind of, kind of connections and networking and knowing the right people um, is kind of is, is a very, very strong currency there, um, particularly during the time where uh, the author was was kind of making his big breakout. And so that's the other thing you need to know about this author is that he made just oodles and oodles and oodles of cash. He and his wife, uh, Whitney, um, they just they used they leveraged these connections that they had with Chinese officials to just make obscene amounts of money doing like real estate and things like that. Um, it was highly corrupt, but it's the kind of thing where I guess everyone was corrupt. And so, you know, you can't really blame them as much for being just like one among a group of super corrupt people. Um, but the thing that was kind of interesting to me as I was listening to this story is that um, Mr. Shum Desmond. So he kind of comes up from this background uh, of being like an outsider in a lot of ways. So his, his grandfather owned land um, in, in pre um, revolutionary China. And so when Mao Zedong took over, he kind of created a new caste system where landowners were really pretty darn near the bottom. Um, and so Desmond's family kind of had to carry that around with them for like ever after that, that their grandfather was, it was a dirty, no good stinking landowner. And so he ended up being in kind of a lower caste and that affected the opportunities that he had. But then it was during a time like fresh off of the Chinese revolution. Um, but like kind of post mass starvation. So like in, in that kind of period where they're starting to kind of come out of like the worst part of um, the Maoist regime where like people's like sort of have food now, um, but they're still like deeply, deeply under kind of the central planning thumb of the communist party. So for example, like this guy Desmond, he's pretty tall and pretty athletic. And so he like, um, like did sports and things like that at school. But then one day someone from the communist party came to their school and had all of the boys stripped down to their skivvies and line up in a row. And he was like, okay, I'm going to decide who's the athletes and what sports they do. And so he was walking down the line and, uh, he got to Desmond and he's like, ah, you're a tall boy and you've got long arms and long fingers. You will be a swimmer now. And he's like, uh, okay, but I don't know how to swim. And he went home and told his parents and his dad's like, well, I guess if the party says it, then you're going to be a swimmer. So he like takes him down to the pool and then his dad just yeets him into the water and he had to learn to swim that way. Uh, he said that that was pretty typical, kind of the sink or swim mentality among Chinese uh, parents during that time period, I guess. And so... Yeah, his parents just like, yote him into the pool. And then, but what's kind of interesting is that he actually did get really, really good at swimming. He spent a lot of time practicing, um, kind of uh, because he was supposed to. And he, he got he got really good. And he swam through high school and he swam uh, in college. And he ends up getting a scholarship um, to go to America to go to school. And he goes to the University of Wisconsin. And uh, studies there and he's he really kind of picks up a lot of um, I guess um, American kind of cultural vibes he works really hard to be able to speak English um, almost to the annoyance of his of his Chinese classmates who think that he's just showing off but he's just really really um, aggressively trying to learn the language he wants to be able to um, use that. And he, he definitely wants, uh, right away, he knows he wants to go into a career in financing. <clears throat> so he, he studies hard. He gets a cool job at a big, um, financial firm doing cool things. And then, um, he is offered the opportunity to, uh, have a green card and kind of immigrate to the United States, but he turns it down. He's just, he, cause he's, he's all in on China. He is, bought into the um, the idea that China is on the rise and it's going to be this great country and he wants to go back and make his mark in China. And it, it's his personal honor kind of compels him to do that. And so he goes over there and he kind of lives this high life, this like flash and dash kind of thing through his late 20s and into his 30s. He makes a ton of money and loses a ton of money and just really has this like roller coaster kind of experience. Um, and then in his mid 30s, he kind of he meets Whitney and they sort of um, recognize 
in each other that like they are both very ambitious they're both very talented and so they're like okay let's um we're gonna ride this gravy train to the top together and so they kind of almost like do an arranged marriage but with themselves where there's like there's basically no romantic feelings at all between them but they're um they like they calculate together like their compatible attributes and the different things that they bring to ta- to the table. And Whitney in particular is very, very, very ambitious. She like wants to go all the way to the top and she's not going to let anyone get in her way. And so Desmond's like, all right, he's, he's just like intoxicated by this woman loves her. Um, she doesn't necessarily love him at first. They don't have a, like I said, very much of a spark in their relationship, but he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to follow you around and we're going to make this happen. And so um, they they kind of start to court this uh, woman that they call Auntie Zhang. And um, basically, Auntie Zhang is this. She's the wife of a high ranking minister in the Communist Party in China. And so this was woman, Auntie Zhang, has tons and tons of connections. And Whitney's really trying to be like almost a surrogate daughter. Um, and just really, really kind of get involved and really like wait on Auntie Zhang hand and foot and like try to get as much Guangxi or that social capital as she can to kind of leverage into their potential business dealings. And uh, it goes really, really well for them really, really quickly. And they make just oodles and oodles and oodles of money. Um, and they do it kind of on the sly. Like they they end up like setting up an airport um, like uh, um, like customs zone, like duty free, tax free kind of a thing. And just throughout the entire process, um, the, the Chinese communist party is like, they're trying to be like all, um, uh, like anti-materialist, anti-capitalist and all this stuff. But like behind the scenes, everyone is just super, super corrupt. And there's a black market for everything. Like the Chinese Navy, like, uh, like this is one of the things in the story that was kind of interesting because uh, it is, it's kind of amusing to think of it. But like the Chinese Navy were sailing around the world um, smuggling beer and like do like doing like liquor runs uh, to smuggle beer into China and like sell it on the black market. Like even even, you know, captains of the Navy were in on these heists. And so when these uh, when Desmond and Whitney, they try to set up this port in the airport, this duty free kind of customs area, they have to get a ton of different signatures. So they blew, blow through a ton of Guangxi and social capital to meet the right people and kind of like bribe the right people and grease the right wheels. And then they get like tons of signatures and tons of people on board. Anyways, they make this thing happen. And then they start to like build hotels and like, they're just, they're just they're They have this meteoric rise in wealth and they're like, they're, They're talking about like their conspicuous consumption, uh, like buying sports cars and, you know, Bentleys. And oh, and one thing that was kind of uh, freaky um, is that there's like, I guess, different license plates in Beijing. And so like um, ministers of the uh, party, they have their own um, license type of license plate. The police have their own license plate. The military have their own license plates. And then everyone else just kind of has like commoner license plates. And if you have the right license plate, then uh, you're allowed to make illegal U-turns. You're allowed to run red lights. You're allowed to speed. Like you're, if you have the right license plate that can, uh, that can go a long way for you. And so uh, Whitney ends up bribing a, an official so that she can get a really sweet uh, license plate for her sports car. So she can run red lights and do different things and just like give you kind of an idea of like the corruption that's kind of inherent in the Chinese system. So like a high ranking government official, this is a, this is a news story that I had heard um, in a previous podcast. And then similar things were alluded to throughout this book. So I just thought I'd, I'd just kind of like use this as a good example. But um this high ranking minister, he's speeding down the road and he hits and kills someone with his car. Um, and the police show up and they kind of tape off the area and they're like, oh, man, what are we going to do? We don't want this guy to like, you know, be in trouble because he's Mr. Big Shot in the party. So anyways, a few days later, some uh, disheveled looking bum comes in off of the street and says, yes, uh, I stole this guy's car and then drove it fast and killed somebody with it. Please disappear me into the gulag or whatever the Chinese labor camps are called. Um, and they did, they were like, oh, you, you bad, bad man for doing that. You're, I'm, you're definitely going to a labor camp and, uh, 
you know, but we in our magnanimity and our generosity will pay your family uh, some money so that they don't have to go without. And then it's like, oh, I see what you did there. You bribed a poor person to give up his life so that his family can uh, be taken care of and take the fall for you. Nice, nice, real sneaky, real cool. And just, you know, stuff like that seems to be kind of the norm in the Chinese Communist Party. They're just, they're, they're just you know, generally corrupt. They're just like making each other disappear all the time. They're stealing intellectual property. They're like, the state is like, like forcing its way into these private businesses and then like making them spy on behalf of the Chinese communist party. So like, it's really, it's, it's really kind of obnoxious, um, business practices. And like, that's to say nothing of their human rights violations, which I will say something about those certainly. Um, but just like for their business practices, that's one thing that's like always kind of gotten under my skin. So I go to law school, I go to business school, um, and the professors at both are always like, Oh yeah, you should definitely do business with China for sure. Definitely. Definitely. There's no downside, no material or foreseeable downside to doing business with China at all that we can think of. We who are, you know, stooges. Um, (laughs) I don't want to imply that, you know, my professors are stooges of the Chinese communist party, um, unless they are, but they're probably not. But at any rate, there, there seems to be this consensus among the uh, academics that um, it's a good idea to do business in China. And I will use my zero experience uh, and my zero expertise to respectfully disagree. I think there is every reason to distrust the entire system over there. They're effectively using child slave labor to you know keep wages low. They're using like like Uyghur slave labor. Uh, slave labor to like make different products and they're like actively genociding the Uyghur people right now which is just the worst like they're just they're just straight up evil right there's this religious minority over there that is uh the Uyghurs they're a Muslim minority in China and the Chinese government is rounding them up and um, forcibly sterilizing them and supposedly even like harvesting their organs and different things like that it's really it's a bad deal and so like they've rounded them all up and they're putting them in these camps where they do labor for the state and you know that just doesn't sit super well with me i i don't think i would feel comfortable with like making a cool business idea and then being like you know what i could really save a lot of money if i just was willing to have uh slave children make this for me um far across the sea that that doesn't really work for me and then what makes it worse is that the party is like actively going to spy on you um, and steal your intellectual property and turn it over to the Chinese Communist Party for the the advancement of China. So, um, you know, nothing against the Chinese people. I know uh, a number of Chinese people who are lovely and perfectly wonderful and nice and kind. And I've, I've got absolutely nothing against the Chinese people. I think that in, in many ways, um, many Chinese people are the most um they're the most victimized by the regime of uh xi jinping the current chinese president oh and i gotta talk about him and his um blood-soaked rise to power he basically uh, made his rivals disappear which is you know basic evil dictator stuff you know no surprises there i'm sure if you're familiar with like any history at all but yeah he made his rivals disappear he used you know he's the son of a of a one of the uh revolutionaries and so he's got he's got this good blood for the job and people really thought he was just a swell guy and then the people who didn't think he was such a swell guy ended up just you know dying mysteriously in car accidents and things like that and now he's just the swellest guy and nobody would ever say anything other than that he's a swell guy and nobody would ever mention that he looks just like a dead ringer for winnie the pooh in fact winnie the pooh is banned in china now because so many people um were mistaken in their assessment that President Xi Jinping looks like Winnie the Pooh. I certainly don't think that. I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that you look up side by side photographs of the two of them and compare for yourself, um, because I, I I just don't see the resemblance personally. And I don't want to get censored. I don't want to have this podcast taken down. Um, so, you know, I'm going to tread carefully here, lest I offend um, 
you know, either the Chinese Communist Party or the bootlicking American corporations that are willing to, you know, trade their dignity for some of that sweet, sweet, sweet slave money. I'm guessing by now you probably understand how I feel about this. But yeah, Xi Jinping, uh, kind of evil. And basically, um, after a little while, this guy, back to the story, I guess, his he kind of falls out of favor with the Communist Party. And they uh, start to kind of be on the outs, especially Xi Jinping um, rises to power. As soon as he rises to power, he's like, oh, I better kick the ladder down behind me so that no one else comes up and tries to... Uh, supplant me and so he he engages in this like purge of he's like well we're going to deal with all of the corruption except for mine but we're going to deal with all of the corruption in the party and so like he, he like uh imprisons like millions and millions and millions of people he investigates like 40 million party members or something like that uh, and they're all you know fined and fired and imprisoned and all this stuff just just like this vast 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 purge of anyone who might be a problem and our main character kind of finds himself on the outskirts of a purge like he knows people who are being purged and he's like oh boy i uh, i'm definitely guilty by association here um i definitely did some shady dealings with these guys and so he flees the country and then later on um he finds out that his wife whitney is just missing like the chinese government just picked her up and disappeared her and she was gone for like a decade until until this Desmond Shum guy decided to publish this very book. And then all of a sudden she calls him out of the blue and says, hey, I'm alive. Please don't publish that book. And he's like, what? Where are you? Who, who's with you? What's happened to you? Where have you been all this time? And she's like, hey, just please don't publish that book, you know, because... I might have to go back to Gulag. And so anyways, he's like, I'm sorry. I already published it. It's already out. Tom already read it. He's already talking about it on his podcast. And so, yeah, sorry, Whitney. Uh, I hope that the Chinese government lets you go. But yeah, we're kind of in a position now where we all kind of have to like lift our head up and say, hey, those guys over there who are running China, somewhat evil somewhat into genocide somewhat into uh kidnapping people and imprisoning people and disappearing people and enslaving people and uh, brutalizing people and killing people and bribing american journalists to look the other way on the hong kong protests and pretend like they weren't as big of a deal as they were and then the new york times actually did it because they're a bunch of shills that kind of thing um you know just basic dictator stuff and so now my man Desmond, he's obviously probably afraid to go to sleep at night, lest the Chinese uh, government send someone after him. And so we're kind of in this position where, you know, I, I don't want to um, I don't want to offend anybody politically here. I really don't. But um, if you're on the fence about China, you really should do a little bit of um um, digging and some research. And there's really not a whole lot that's redeeming about the regime. They're really aggressive. They're really, really, I mean, nasty to dissidents. They will crush anyone who gets in their way. I mean, the Tiananmen Square massacre, right? Like the Chinese government just massacred thousands of students who protested. They were like, hey, give us democracy. And they're like, how about we give you tanks? And by give you tanks, we mean run over you with tanks and also shoot you with guns. Um, and that's kind of as far as China goes when it comes to negotiating with their own people for rights. And so, you know, China is a wonderful place. It's a beautiful place with a rich culture and a rich heritage. Right now, though, it's kind of a troubling, it's troubling times for China because, you know, Xi Jinping changed the law in China. So now he can be emperor for life. Um, basically, and they can't get rid of him and he's consolidated his power and eliminated his rivals. And now he's building up the Chinese uh, military and he's he's starting to kind of consolidate power again to the central government. Basically, what happens is um, the Chinese government, the Communist Party will engage in central planning and. Um, that will fail catastrophically and literally millions of people will starve to death. 
then they'll say, hmm, we better let people do a little business. Then the wonderful, industrious, proud, intelligent, fierce people of China will rise up and create excellent new ventures and innovate and build and and develop and grow and like like nobody's business right like these guys they're they're amazing they're amazing builders um just and like it, they've got this super strong vibrant culture um and they'll become rich super fast like we've seen that like this meteoric rise of of china and the chinese economy and then um, once things are nice and stable and everyone's got three square meals a day again, the Chinese Communist Party will be like, mm, seems like this capitalism is kind of getting out of control it's starting to starting to think that maybe we should take control again. And so now we're seeing um, the Chinese Communist Party starting to circle the wagons again, starting to undercut foreign investment, starting to like really, really pull um, these private firms in, into the state kind of clutches their they're basically seizing a bunch of assets and seizing a bunch of um, corporate contracts and things like that. They're, they're making China communist again. And that doesn't really bode well for anybody because, you know, it's either going to be starvation or war, most likely. And uh, I think this book was uh, was very eye opening to me because it helped to illustrate just kind of the insider's perspective on this. We get a lot of. Um, we get a lot of kind of uh, our own biased um, anti-Chinese uh, American propaganda in a lot of ways. Uh, not not a ton of it comes from you know the mainstream media because they are all at least partially owned by the Chinese Communist Party. But but like you know we kind of have these rumors that like ah we got to watch out for China you know they they might be kind of the next big main bad guy or whatever you know I think a lot of people I've talked to kind of have that sense. Um, but but yeah, the the kind of uh, it's kind of in the wind now that we're going to have to deal with, you know, Xi Jinping's uh, aggression and his his desire to kind of move China into a new uh, a new era of of, I guess, regional domination, at least. And then um, for me, it was really cool to see the insider perspective on that uh, as someone who's like, um, who obviously really loves China. Um, but, but has, you know, his, his family has been destroyed by it, right? Like he, he has a son who misses his mom because his mom was disappeared by the Chinese government for being, uh, in business too much, right? Like, it, like it's bad out there. And so, um, on that cheerful note, <laughs> I guess we'll wrap up the things that I liked. It, were, were those things that I liked? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know that I actually liked any of this book when I'm thinking about it. It's, it's kind of, it kind of, uh, sucks. Um, I mean, it's a good book and it's very interesting and very informative, but it sucks that it's a thing, man. And, uh, and we, we should all be heads up on that. We should have eyes wide open and be very, very aware that the Chinese communist party is using a lot of money to impact, uh, American media and to try and sway public perception in America in favor of the Chinese government. We should all be very, very aware that that's happening, uh, not only in mainstream media, but also in Hollywood, you know, the, the top gun patches had to be taken the sorry the taiwan patch in top gun um off had to be taken off of uh tom cruise's flight suit because the chinese censors were like hey there's no such thing as taiwan uh so take that off there's also no such thing as tibet so don't mention anything about tibet uh there's also no no such thing as um bad guys in china so you know red dawn just make that north koreans even though that's like the least plausible possible bad guy to invade the united states since they don't have food or airplanes but yeah you know Chinese censorship is everywhere. It's through the media, it's in Hollywood, um, and it's it's pervaded to the highest halls of academia as well. So, you know, we people, you know, we should have some brotherhood with the people of China who are who are also being subjected to the tyranny of the Chinese Communist Party. And we should all look out for each other because the last thing we want to do is to uh, end up looking down the barrel of guns at each other, which could, I mean, history shows us that could so easily happen. And so we've all got to be conscientious. We've all got to be careful. So um, I, I, on that cheerful um, prognostication of the war, <laughs> let's move over to the science corner and talk about something else. All right. 
right? So in the spirit of sticking with our Chinese theme, but also talking about science, I want to talk about the invention of gunpowder, which is a super cool thing that the Chinese came up with back in ye olden days. Um, and I read an article that said that they likely came up with it just by mixing stuff together. They most likely just were like, okay, we've got this stuff. Let's mix it together and see what happens. And then they're like, holy crap, this stuff exploded. Um, I don't know where the author gets his sources in claiming that, but, <laughs> but like, whatever, uh, who am I to, to say how it was made? But basically, uh, Gunpowder has three main ingredients. It has charcoal, sulfur, and something called saltpeter or, or potassium nitrate. And charcoal is just burnt wood that's been deprived of oxygen. That's, that's you know, pretty readily available. Um, sulfur is like a yellow crumbly rock that's found under the surface of, you know, the earth. Uh, it's pretty abundant and easy to find in a lot of places, um, particularly near like hot springs and things like that. Saltpeter, though, on the other hand, that can be a little bit tricky. Um, and one uh, surefire method that I have read about to make saltpeter, <laughs> excuse me, is to uh, get a barrel and fill it with poo. Um, human is fine. Animal is fine. Which is whatever is at hand. Fill it with poo. Um, have you and all of your friends get together and pee just a whole bunch in this barrel. Just, you know, just just pee just a, just a lot into the barrel of poo. Um, stir it up real good. Toss some ashes in there. Maybe toss some toss some like I don't know animal pee if you got it, and and just you know. Kind of stir it up, a little bit of water maybe to keep it nice and runny. And then uh, you leave it. You leave it for a real long time. And then you come back and stir it. And then, you know, after, you know, maybe a year or so, you dump out your your hideous concoction uh, and pour it out into trays, shallow trays. And there, the trays will be full of um, saltpeter crystals. They're white potassium nitrate crystals. And you, you just nab all those or sift all those out as in whatever way you see, you see fit after your poo has poo and pee is all dried up. And then you have that and you mix, you know, you mix it with the, uh, <laughs> with the sulfur and charcoal that you have and it's pretty good it, it turns into gunpowder and it's uh yeah it's used for guns it's used for explosives it was used for fireworks it's it turns out to be a pretty useful thing uh and and you know is made from pee and poo, I guess. So that is the science corner. We're moving on over to the history corner. All right, so sticking with the Chinese theme, I'm talking about history and nobody has cooler history than the Chinese. It seems like they have done everything firstest and bestest and coolest in a lot of different areas. And so what I wanted to talk about today was something that I think is particularly awesome, and that is the Terracotta Army. If you haven't seen any pictures of the Terracotta Army, do yourself a favor and look it up. It's it's just an amazing, amazing spectacle of uh, just Chinese history and um like their dedication to their ancestors and, and, uh, their ingenuity in creating it's basically, it's, a it's part of a burial ritual for, um, their, their sculptures of men, their armies, right? Uh, it's an army that's made up of sculptures and they're, they're very, very lifelike. They look awesome. They're amazing. And they're standing in like ranks all over this tomb area. There's, there's like eight, thousand soldiers and like 130 chariots 500 horses like it, it's it's amazing right and it's for this emperor he's the he's the first emperor of china and i'm going to try and say his name but i i am most likely gonna butcher it but it's uh qin shi huang uh and he's started the the qin dynasty um which it, it it, so he, he's a big deal, right? The Qin dynasty, which I assume is where we get the name China. Uh, I'm not sure, but that, that'd be my best guess. Anyways, 
this these terracotta soldiers are amazing you got to check them out they basically they, they were buried with this guy in his necropolis this huge huge army in this huge huge tomb a uh, very very cool tribute to uh, someone that they obviously thought was you know, extremely important man. I doubt I'll get very many terracotta soldiers for my own funeral, if any. Um, maybe I can request that. Anyways, this has been the Science Corner. Let's move over to the Random Corner. All right. For the Random Corner today, we're talking about Mao Zedong, who was just kind of the man most responsible for the most death. Uh, of any person, really. So he created the Great Leap Forward program, which was a colossal fail and resulted in the deaths of up to 55 million people of starvation, which just sucks. Like, it was just a dumb idea. They're like, let's uh, let's have these farmers make steel in their backyards. And also we're doing collectivized farming now, uh, collectivization of agriculture. You're not allowed to be a private farmer anymore, so we all got to work together, um, but badly and we all got to grow the wrong crops and we all got to fail hard at everything we try and do. And then uh, millions and millions and millions of people die. And then wouldn't you know it um, when when pushed on, wow, Mr. Mao, your uh, your idea got just, you know, 55 million people killed. Uh, do you think it went badly? He says, no, uh, it was actually a super good idea. It just didn't work out because of all of the people who disagreed with me and opposed me. If it weren't for them, it would have been a total communist utopia. So um, I don't know. I don't know how you want to apply that in your personal life and in your modern political uh, persuasions. I'll leave that up to you. But just remember that uh, when the government says, hey, I have a super sick idea that we should all try or else I'll shoot you. Um, and then they say, hey, this would have totally worked if it weren't for all the people who disagreed with me. Yeah, that might be a hint that something's a little off. Anyways, let's go back to the main review. All right, so we're kind of closing in on running out of time here. This was a weird one. I'm I'm, I'm not going to lie to you because a lot of the things that I that I talked about in the things that I liked section were things that I didn't like, but that I liked about the book. Right. So like, like I didn't like all the talk about, um, you know, disappearing dissidents, uh, and murdering your political rivals and enslaving, uh, vast swaths of, of, you know, your, your people. Um, I didn't love that. <laughs> um, but uh, but it was very interesting. It is part of the book that that drew me to the book in the first place. This this was um, it, it, it didn't feel entertaining. It felt important. And, you know, sometimes it's good to pick up books that are just you read them because they're important. It's an important thing to know. It's an important thing to think about. And so, um, yeah, if there's if there's anything that I didn't like about this book, I kind of alluded to it at the beginning. When I picked it up, I was like, yes, I'm going to learn about the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, the first 80 percent of this book is this guy's autobiography. And it talks a lot about him, like being on the swim team as a kid. And like, no offense to my man Desmond, but like, I do not care about his swim team antics. I did not care about like how much fun he had in college. I did not care about like really anything at all. I, other than the thing that I picked up the book to learn about. And so, uh, the fact that that was 80% of the book that I think drops this book, just like a whole bunch in my estimation. The other thing that I didn't love is that, um, he's kind of like, I guess in a way he's kind of like a snitch that like, cause he was doing it too. He was partaking of the corruption and stepping on people. And, um, you know, there were allegations that he was involved in some shifty stuff and maybe was involved in some disappearances of, of rivals or whatnot. Um, but he's like, you know, now I'm a good guy and you can definitely trust me. So uh, I'm aware that there are some, uh, pretty strong biases at play here. And that this maybe doesn't tell the most accurate picture of the internal 
kind of organism of China. But what's kind of emerging from the bigger picture is that uh, there's a lot going on over there that isn't good and that we should all be aware of and that we should all be, you know, um, trying to be heads up about maybe, you know, whatever you can do. I, the thing is, is I can't do anything. Um, no one's asked me uh, the, the, you know, I haven't spoken to President Xi Jinping in, in, in weeks. Uh, and the last time I talked to him, he didn't ask me um, for any advice on how to run China. So, uh, you know, I don't know what to do other than to just be like aware of it and maybe like spread the good word that like, Hey, uh, not as, not everything is going so hot in China right now. And we should all be aware of that. And, you know, maybe, uh, if you can afford to do it, maybe allow that to affect the way that you consume products that, you know, you, you might want to make sure that they weren't made in a concentration camp or in a child sweatshop, you know, that might be nice. I know, you know, I know I like me some cheap goods, but at the same time, you know, it, it might be kind of time to start voting with our pocketbooks on things like this. So without further ado, I'm going to give this book my patented one of a kind, super duper special rating of the bells. Here we go. Oof, that's right, guys. This is a two star book. Um, it's an important book, and I picked it up because I was really, really into the premise and I wanted to learn more about it. I found it very, very appealing. Um, but it's just kind of dumb that it wasted so much of my time. And for me, I don't know about you guys out there. That's a big irritation for me. If I buy a book that says it's going to tell me something, right? Like, like what was the subtitle of this book again? Let, let me read that again. Um, it was the, it was Red Roulette, an insider story of wealth, power, corruption, and vengeance in today's China. Not, uh, you know, little Desmond joins the swim team and, you know, nine chapters of that. So uh, that was irritating to me wasn't my favorite. And so for that reason, uh, even though this is an important book, I think it was just kind of a waste of time. Also, I think, uh, I think Desmond might, um, be the bad guy. I don't know for sure. Um, but I was getting, you know, slight bad guy vibes throughout. Um, so, you know, one of those things where maybe we've got an untrustworthy narrator situation going on or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too harsh on this book, but like when books waste my time, they earn lower bells from me, even if the subject matter is super cool and super important. And with that, my friends, I'm going to move on to the parting thought. But first, I wanted to tell you all, thank you so, so much for your support, for your wonderful feedback, for um, your suggestions of books for me to read. I, I'm going to I'm going to check them all out eventually. Definitely. Um, as of this recording, I am I finished another book that's going to be coming next, and I'm about halfway through another book that's going to be coming up. Uh, I'm piling through these uh, at least two a week. So um, you know the episodes. I'm going to kind of get to them when I get to them. Um, like I said, this is right now as of this recording, it is a little past one in the morning. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to get to bed. I have class in the morning, but I wanted to take the time to talk to you guys about this because I think it's super important. Thank you so much. If you like this podcast, please share it with somebody who you think would get a kick out of it. If you haven't already, please subscribe or leave a review. Anything you can do that can kind of help the algorithms pick this up and, and put it in someone else's face. That would mean a lot to me. Um, I'd like to think that I'm not just talking into this microphone in the middle of the night to nobody. So every time I hear from any of you that you've listened to it, that you've gotten something out of it, it seriously means the world to me. So thank you all so much. If you want to pick up this book, um, you can click on the link that's in the description for wherever you're getting this podcast. Um, and that will take you to my Amazon affiliate link. You buy it there and you will support the podcast. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And Amazon will give me a few pennies for sending you over to the book. So with that, let's move on to the parting thought and get you guys sent out on your way. And I wanted to stick with uh, the Chinese theme and really go to Sun Tzu in the art of war. I love Sun Tzu. It's my favorite. And there's like a million quotes and some of the longest quotes are super good and super full of they're chock full of ancient Chinese wisdom. And I love it. And I'll probably include more of his quotes 
later on. But this is what this one is short and sweet and to the point and right on theme with the message that I want to leave with you guys today about China. Sun Tzu, quote, the greatest victory is that which requires no battle, end quote. We have got to find a way to deal with China that doesn't involve going to war with the Chinese people. We don't want that. They don't want that. We got to avoid it at all costs. And I don't know what that looks like, but man, oh man, I don't want to be in a shooting war with my brothers and sisters across the world. And I'll leave you guys with that. Have a good day. You deserve it. Goodbye.